uh, I share with my, my uh, colleagues here kind of the, the anxiety of feeling that everything has already been uh, said during these last fascinating uh, three days. And um, hopefully, uh, my hope is that this, this presentation allows to bring to bear on the maritime environment some of the, the problems, the, the issues that we've been discussing uh, more broadly and also point to how uh, some of these technologies can be used uh, against the grain. Oh, I completely forgot that actually. Sorry, I need a cable for sound. Thank you. So this is a very brief summary of uh, what is now known as the, the Left to Die uh, incident, as told by uh, Dan Haile Gebre, uh, one of the survivors, the nine survivors uh, of this incident out of the 72 people who, um, who, who left the coast of Tripoli at, uh, on the 27th of March 2011. Uh, during the, the NATO military, NATO-led military intervention in uh, Libya. This case has been uh, the basis for several legal cases um, against the different states who were taking part in this uh, intervention, uh, led by a coalition of NGOs and mainly the, the French GST, Microrope, as well as the, um, the, the FIDH. And uh, myself was in the Center for Research Architecture in, in London, my colleague uh, Lorenzo Pizzani, as well as the architectural uh, architecture practice C2 Studio based in uh, New York. We contributed to the work of this coalition by um, trying to reconstruct as precisely as possible the, the unfolding of events and uh, the, the different actors uh, involved. And of course, this, this constituted a, a major challenge for us, right? Since uh, in, the, in the open sea where this incident occurred, there, there, is, there, is very, uh, there are very few civilian uh, witnesses, right? How can you reconstruct this, uh, this incident? Well, in addition to uh, a very detailed interview with Dan Haile Gebre, but also other uh, survivors in which we really try to reconstruct step by step the, the, the unfolding uh, of the events. We also combined uh, their testimonies with uh, different 
geo-localized data that we could gather, for example, through uh, the distress signals, the several distress signals that they sent, or through the spotting by a French aircraft at the very beginning of uh, their trajectory. And we reconstructed their, their trajectory up to the moment of their drift. From the moment of their drift, we brought, if you will, the, the sea itself to bear witness in the sense that we asked uh, an oceanographer to reconstruct the trajectory of uh, the migrants drifting boat, which drifted, as, as you will have understood, during 14 days in uh, the NATO maritime surveillance uh, area. Once we had the entire trajectory of uh, the migrant's vessel, well, the question was, who was there? Which ships were there, were informed of uh, the migrants' distress, both through these dif different distress signals, but also through information sent out by NATO Maritime Command to all vessels under its uh, command. And we knew that there were 38 naval assets deployed uh, in this area on the 23rd of March, uh, according to a Department of Defense uh, document. And we know that this, this, uh, this, the number of assets actually went rising in the days that, uh, that followed. But the question was, where were they? And so we, to try and answer this question, we relied on synthetic aperture radar imagery, which is a kind of satellite imagery which uh, is based on radar technology, so basically a, a radar beamed from uh, outer space. And through this, uh, the analysis by uh, remote sensing experts of this imagery, we, we could determine that there were a number of large vessels, as you see, very, very close to uh, the location of the drifting boat at the time uh, the, the image was, uh, was taken. Now, this image in particular is a 75 meter resolution. That is, one pixel is 75 uh, meters. Which means that what we can say is that there were a number of large vessels, but we cannot say if they were commercial or military and let alone determine the identity of those uh, vessels uh, at that time. Nonetheless, it's already, I think, a strong um, image of a, of a you know, populated sea surrounding this, uh, this boat that was simply drifting once again for 14 days in what was probably the most surveyed waters on Earth at that time. Uh, in, at, at that time. Now, the, yeah, we, we also used uh, data on the information on this, the surveillance equipment on board these ships or on board the various aircrafts. Here you see uh, a US P3 Orion uh, aircraft, which just a few months after these events uh, participated in a rescue operation uh, in this very same space and which was perfectly able to detect uh, a migrant's vessel of a very uh, equivalent characteristics to uh, that used by the, the migrants in the, in the case in question. So they were there, they were informed, they had the means to know, they did know, and they didn't do anything. The legal uh, cases are ongoing, again, in, in different uh, countries. And again, while there are several questions that remain uh, open, we, don't need, we, we do not know the identity of the helicopters or the two helicopters that uh, visited twice the migrants. We do not know the identity of <clears throat> the, the large military ship that uh, encountered the migrants um, on the, f the 4th, probably, of April. That is, as uh, Dan Haile uh, said, when up to half the migrants on board had already passed away. And actually, there were people dying in their very uh, arms. Now, in this, uh, in this presentation, I've, I've gone very quickly uh, over uh, how we've attempted to, to uh, reconstruct this incident. And what I would like to try and do in, in what remains is try to, to understand what's, what's, what are the conditions 
that allowed this incident to occur? What, what are the, the, the forms of, of bordering of the sea that shaped the behavior of, uh, of, of, these, uh, of these multiple different actors, right, from Italian to Maltese Coast Guards to NATO forces to fishermen uh, as well. We, we didn't uh, even uh, mention them. In short, what I want to ask is how has the sea been made to kill, right? As, as you see in this case, and as this, uh, this map by, uh, by Migros Europe, uh, Olivier Colchard here, but also Nicolas Lambert, who participated in this uh, 2000 version uh, of the Atlas, the, the over 13,000 documented deaths at the maritime borders of the EU are mostly uh, deaths through drowning or uh, lack of food and water through drifting. That is, it is the sea that kills rather than the bullets of, of border guards. And I, I would like to ask how, how this has come to, how this has come to be. Now, in, uh, in her influences of geographic uh, environment, uh, Ratzel's disciple, Helen Churchill's, Churchill Semple argues that amongst the many different types of natural boundaries that set more or less effective limits to the movement of people in the territorial growth of states. The sea is the only absolute boundary because it alone blocks the continuous, unbroken expansion of people. And yet, in Semple's, uh, in this very uh, work, Semple argues herself that uh, men, by appropriating the mobile forces in the air and water to increase his own powers of locomotion, has become a cosmopolitan uh, being. So the sea constitutes a boundary prior to the capacity of humanity to, to navigate, but it is, all, it is also the, the medium that enables movement, right? And we know that in the, the Mediterranean Sea, since several uh, millen millennia, in fact, the sea has been uh, intensely crossed, first on the, along the coast and then increasingly uh, across its entire, um, its entire surface. Today, the Mediterranean is one of the most densely traveled maritime areas on Earth, with uh, you know, across to, close to 30% of uh, maritime traffic that crosses it uh, on, a daily, uh, on a daily basis. And uh, of course, as you can, you can imagine, the, uh, not only the crossing of the sea intensified, but uh, it became increasingly uh, safer, right, with, with uh, modern modes of, um, of navigation. You, you understand with me that I'm, I'm asking almost rhetorical questions here, but maybe with the, the naive gaze because for me, this is how is this possible? No, uh, that when we can cross the sea so easily, it becomes uh, so deadly. And uh, these days, uh, living uh, since a few months in uh, Tunisia, you you, f you start to feel this this uh, depth violence, this this form of containment, which uh, Tunisians who are denied the, the right to uh, mobility through various forms of uh, policy and administrative boundaries, which we saw very well through the, the presentation of uh, Federica uh, this morning. The, the, the violence of these boundaries, which uh, enable these many, the, you, you, I'm not sure you see this very well on the, the slide, but. Uh, the, the, the maritime space uh, in front of the, the port of Tunis is populated daily by lines of, uh, of vessels that enter and exit this, uh, this port. And of course, people are denied the capacity to um, move in that, that, that same way. And because of this uh, denial, they have been, those who have uh, wanted to enact their freedom of movement, despite this legal and administrative dis denial, have been, of course, forced to embark on uh, precarious and uh, clandestine modes of, uh, modes of crossing. But what I want to come into now is how the space of the sea itself has been striated by 
different forms of, uh, of bordering. And uh, for, for, for many years, a kind of vision of the sea as a boundless uh, expanse, right? As opposed, uh, in which the, the sea, this is really a, a Carl Schmitt kind of paradigmatic uh, formulation of the binary between land and sea, in which uh, since it is not possible to inscribe stable boundaries onto the surface of the ocean, it is not possible to occupy the surface of uh, the ocean as it is possible to do on land, therefore, the maritime space is uh, an abs a space of absolute freedom, right? And this, this uh, formulation found its expression in uh, maps, atlases of the world as of the 17th century, which increasingly represented the land with infinite detail and borders, while the sea itself became an abstract space open to uh, free navigation. And in fact, this, this uh, binary representation continues to this day in uh, any atlas or, of course, with uh, our, our digital atlas of uh, Google Maps uh, and so forth, right? In fact, what uh, a geographer like Philip Steinberg shows is that the sea, at least uh, since, uh, since, since uh, in, in the modern era, um, has always been striated by forms of bordering that simultaneously reproduced the, the territorial logic of carving up of, uh, of the sea, uh, legal architecture of the, of the sea as it's mainly defined by uh, the UNCLOS, uh, with territorial waters that extends 12 nautical miles into the sea, uh, contiguous zone in which uh, the state can exercise uh, customs functions, border uh, functions, but also uh, exclusive economic zones uh, in which state may have exclusive rights over res resources both in the sea, such as uh, fisheries, but also under, uh, in the subsoil uh, of the seas. And in fact, what you come to see is um, uh, a kind of unbundled sovereignty, right? In, in which the, the, the bundle of, um, of attributes, if you will, that compose uh, modern sovereignty onto the land are separated from each other, right? And uh, which, which are defined according to issue and spatial uh, extent. Here, in addition to the, the territorial uh, waters, you have the uh, exclusive economic zones, and also I did not, not mention them yet, but which are fundamental to uh, what I have to say here. Uh, search and rescue zones, which are the areas in which uh, a coastal state is uh, mandated to coordinate rescue of vessels found in distress within uh, that, that area. Now, to this kind of carving up of uh, the sea, there is, uh, in addition, a kind of mobile uh, governance that uh, follows the the trajectory uh, of ships, and as we've heard again and again uh, over the last days, tries to uh, sort good from bad traffic. Uh, and yeah, so again, I'm going to try and go uh, very, very fast here. Uh, as um, uh, despite the, the denial of uh, legal access either to, to European territory and safe uh, forms of transport, forms of uh, clandestine and illegalized migration uh, persisted and uh, uh, an increasingly militarized apparatus uh, to contain this mobility uh, was implemented first by, by border guards as, as of 2006, as uh, Claire said, by Frontex, but also by NATO in the frame of this uh, Operation Active Endeavor. I would have to go uh, into detail into this image, which uh, actually uh, shows something uh, close to what Nick was uh, asking uh, earlier on. Actually, this is a Coast Guard vessel rather than a Border Guard vessel, and this would uh, demand further uh, explanation. Uh, you might be able to discern on this image as well the, the, the a kind of forest of cameras, and this would point certainly to the spect spectacularization of the border. I'll simply point here to the, the radar uh, on it. And again, we've discussed this uh, quite a bit. 
So there's this, this first line, elastic line, if you will, of border patrols, which is inscribed in a wide uh, apparatus of, uh, of sensing, um, which, uh, which allows to, to detect or in which, uh, which is assembled in the, in the aim to detect uh, threats and clandestine uh, forms of mobility uh, amongst uh, all of this. Um, how much now? It's the end. Um, okay. It's the end, my friend. Well, may, maybe I can just conclude very uh, briefly on, uh, on this. In fact, uh, as soon as migrants uh, enter the, the high seas, they, they enter a space of uh, international responsibility, as I've said, through these SAR zones and the fact that uh, the obligation of rescue is supposed to apply to all people in distress at sea uh, indiscriminately. And yet, uh, what states have been trying to do is use these legal norms that were enshrined to ins ensure rescue to the opposite effect, that is to evade responsibility. And I think this is really what we had at work in the left to die boat. While the boat was about to enter the, the Maltese search and rescue uh, area, this is where it's uh, logged its distress call, uh, precisely the, the Maltese and Italian uh, Coast Guard agencies limited themselves to um, inform NATO. NATO on the other hand, was operating kind of minimalist assistance policy during this time in which it aimed not to rescue people, but just to ensure that they could continue until the Maltese or Italian search and rescue areas and let them do uh, the job of rescue, which entails then being responsible for disembarkation. Of course, this is precisely what failed to happen uh, in, uh, in this instance, and um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you.